welcome to ba morning. Welcome to Bahia United Methodist Church. We love we love to connect with you, and you can write us at info at bahiaumc.org, or if you have a prayer need, you can let us know at prayer at bahiaumc.org. Jesus 2020 yard signs are at the back on those tables. They're $10 each, and the money goes to the benevolent fund at the church. So we'll ask y'all when you get through to look at those. We thank God for the successful kidney transplant surgery for Mike Warren. Mike and Brother Stephen are recovering well, as we see. So now we have an announcement related to Mike. Okay, just take it easy, don't go so fast. <laughs> Be careful. What's up? Hey guys, so good to see you. Frankly, it's good to see anybody. <laughs> Um, I do want to say thank you uh, very, very much for all of your prayers and support. Um, it's been quite a journey for Mike and me, and uh, I was the fortunate one because I got to leave the hospital yesterday afternoon. Um, Mike will be hopefully able to come home soon. Um, he has to, he has to uh, make sure that that, that kidney... Uh, works better. Uh, it's been a little slow to react. And, uh, and I think it's kind of funny, actually, because it's, it's, it's actually oversized for me. I think God did an amazing thing because he made my kidney um, bigger, and it fits him just fine. <laughs> but the problem is, uh, it was out of my body so long that uh, it, had to, it was kind of in shock. And so I told Mike the real problem is that um, it needs two shots of espresso. And if they would just give Mike some espresso, that, that puppy would just fire right off. But because we're a little, it's a little um, slow to react, they did have to give him dialysis yesterday. But um, they do think that that is uh, just the one time. And I just want to ask you to continue to pray for Mike. Um, you know, I just really, really need for this thing to work for him uh, so that he can have a quality of life and a longevity of life. Uh, so please be in prayer for Mike. Um, and related to Mike and Cindy, and I want to say thank you. Some of you already have been a, uh, participating in what I'm about to talk about regarding Cassie and me. But um, one of the things this church does really well is we take care of our own, don't we? We love our folks. We should take care of the whole, whole world, but we really take care of our own. We love our, our, our community. And uh, one of the ways we do that is when we have people who have a baby. Cindy, I know. Cindy, you've experienced this. Uh, actually, several of you have experienced where the, there are people in the church who have given you um, the relief of having to prepare meals. And so we do a ministry through our caregiving uh, ministry. And it is, uh, it's, we use a website called takethemameal.com, takethemameal.com. And um, so what you simply have to do, like Katie set this up for Cassie and me. And, and so when you go to that website, you would type our last name in when it asks for the, I guess, the recipient, um, and that would be Biddick. And then the username, I'm sorry, the password, and it would be, it's universally the password every time you do one for our church. It is B-U-M-C. So I presume that when it comes time for Mike and Cindy, it would be Warren and B-U-M-C. And as you do, when you go on that website, It'll show you what days would be available for you to prepare and deliver a meal to the uh, Warren family. 
And I think there may be an address built into that, like where the Warrens live. But if not, you can certainly get that through the church office with no problem. But um, I would encourage you to do that. Now, here's the thing. We don't know when exactly Mike's coming home. We hope it's Tuesday. We hope it's Wednesday, somewhere around there. Uh, so go, get online and look for that. I don't know if Katie's already set it up. Um, and she was uh, uh, going to be here to share this with you. She must have gotten detained. Uh, but uh, please uh, check that out. I want to go ahead and share the two other announcements. And the, really the reason that I got all gussied up and came up here is that I did want to share a couple of very significant events that are happening <clears throat> worldwide um, that we get to participate in. Um, the first one is on Friday night. And for, if you've been a part of Bahia United Methodist Church for any length of time, uh, you know that I am very, uh, very supportive and big on um, New Room Conference, which happens in September every year. This is the sixth year, I think, Bill. And Bill and several of us have been to that conference numerous times. Um, the, the purpose of the conference is to draw the church together in um, a committed, uh, uh, a committed purpose of seeing a a fresh awakening, of a move of God in the people of God. It's not about a denomination or an individual church or an organization. There's no money to be made by that. Um, it is simply uh, a coming together, and we are inspired, if you will, through prayer and worship and. Um, and powerful inspirational messages uh, that move us toward seeking the face of God and calling on the Holy Spirit to change us as a community of the church. And that takes shape in a lot of different ways, uh, but New Room Conference is one of the significant places that we're seeing that happen. And, it, and technically, it is sowing seeds for a great awakening. And so this Friday night, because of COVID, they will not be having an in-person conference, but this Friday night for two hours from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., you can go online to New Room and experience that together. It's not the same because we're not together, but it is the same because the power of God is always present. And you will experience worship and inspiration and we'll prayer together. And there's an afterglow after 8 o'clock. There'll be some additional prayer. Um, some of us are gathering at the house of Diana Skufka. Um, Diana Skufka, and if you need an address there, check the church office. Um, but we will be gathering there uh, as a community. If you feel comfortable doing that, I want to encourage you to, to do that. Or group up with others that you know. Listen, do you, do you sense that that things are just not quite right with this world? <laughs> Do you sense that there's, there's change on the horizon, that things are really changing and, and not always so much for the good, but we are so desperately seeking a fresh move of God in our lives? Are we not? Are we not expecting God to show up? Are we not expecting to be changed as a community of faith are we not expecting that the body of Christ, who are the living hands and feet of God, to actually make an impact in our world? Is that not who we're called to be? Well, New Room Conference is about that. And so I want to encourage you to, to jump in on that. It's absolutely free, but you do need to register. You do need to register, and it's easy to do, newroomconference.org. Just go to newroomconference.org and register. Is that what it says up there? Dot com, dot com, or com, gov, whatever. No, newroomconference.com um, and do that for us. The second thing, I couldn't, I just, I know God did this. I know God did this. It just so happens that this same weekend that New Room Conference is scheduled to do this on Friday night, that on Saturday, there is a call and a move, a, a global awakening from a totally different organization, and it's called The Return. And, um, and there's a number of people behind it, including Franklin Graham and the, uh, the Billy Graham Association. Um, but there's many, many other uh, leaders and churches across the nation and perhaps the world who are participating in this. 
Um, it's called The Return, and at 9 a.m., I think that's Eastern time, so it will be 8 a.m. our time, um, there will be, not that we can be there, but there will be a march on the Washington Mall and a, and a, and a call to repentance and prayer. And I want you to watch this quick 30-second video that just gives a little teaser about it. Watch this. We are standing Volume. at the crossroads, a moment that could seal the future for calamity or redemption. We've driven God out of our culture, out of our lives. We war against his ways. The only answer is to return before it's too late, to bring healing, restoration, and revival. Return to God, and he will return to us. The Return, September 26, 2020. Go to the return.org. There's the .org. <laughs> Go to the return.org, and you can find out more information. And you can also actually log on and be an experience and be a part of this time of, of prayer and of lament and of repentance. There will be, uh, again, amazing uh, speakers that will be speaking to that event. Um, and uh, the primary theme, Bill Sigma, who will be later delivering our message, thank you, Bill, is Second Chronicles 714. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will seek my face, and um, turn from their wicked ways, that's the return part, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. This is what we need, folks. This is what every corner of the globe needs. And we're on the precipice of something amazing. It's a great time to be alive, frankly. And I want to encourage you to be a part of these two events. Don't think that it's for somebody else. It's not for somebody else. It's for the body of Christ. And if you call yourself the body of Christ, then you need to be involved, period. I can't be more plain than that. So with that, I'm going to turn this back over to our amazing friend, um, Carolyn. And Carolyn Burrow, is she not the greatest person ever? She, yeah, she deserves that. For all that she does, for all the people she does, and loves the Lord so much, and loves you so much. So I'm going to ask her to lead us in prayer as we turn our hearts to worship. Dear Lord, we come to you today to thank you for blessings and for your mercy and grace to us. Lord, we need you so much at this time in our world. Help each of us to return to you. Tune our hearts to show your love and compassion to our fellow humans. Let us, let us love and help each other on our journeys here on earth. Continue to lead us in this church to serve you and others. Lead us through our trials and trespasses. Continue to allow us to feel your love and leadership of our lives. May we never forget that we are yours. God bless us all. As we pray as Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Stand with us, Gary. Come, now is the time.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't see it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you Okay, all right, I'm on. Good morning again, everyone. Let's just open with a short prayer. Lord God, may every word from my mouth and all the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your eyes, dear God. Amen. You know, every time I get asked to speak in church or at a church function, I have a bit of a struggle deciding just what am I going to talk about? What kind of a topic do I want? What scripture shall I use? After all, I'm not a silver-tongued orator like uh, John Bob. I'm just an old ex-truck driver. So I picked a subject I'm pretty much an expert at, me. I'll give a little testimony here or a long testimony i don't know whatever it turns out to be for you you who don't know my name is bill sigma i am the third of eight live born children to bill and grace sigma of chicago heights illinois and i say live born because along with those eight kids one of those children my sister Kathy was had a stillborn twin and mom also had a miscarriage in there dad was an eighth grade educated farmer and a veteran of World War II he also survived the infamous Battle of the Bulge As it turns out, this eighth grade educated man turned out to be the smartest man I ever knew. Mom, she was a beautiful valedictorian of her high school class, and she dedicated her life to God, to her husband, 
and to us eight kids. The first four of those children were born between the years of 1946 and 1951. That would be November 46 to October 51. Four kids in less than five years. The last four came between March of 1954 and September of 1966. Now, we didn't have a phone until 1955. And no TV until 1960, which was a blessing, by the way. No washer and dryer for mom until the late 1960s. By the way, if you've never slipped in between a set of crisp, smell-good sheets that have dried on the clothesline, you have really missed a treat. Those, that smell is forever etched in my mind. There was no air conditioning, and believe it or not, it does get very hot and humid in the Chicago area in the summertime. For heat in the wintertime, we had a coal furnace and hot water heater. And it worked on that principle that heat rises. There wasn't no blower on it. It just heat rises. And I remember some of those cold winter mornings. We would go to the windows, scratch our names in the frost on the inside of the window. And we didn't want to set them feet on the ground in the morning when Mom said it's time to get up for school because it was cold. My brother and I were responsible for chopping kindling for that coal furnace to get the furnace to get the fire started. And occasionally, we had to shovel coal, and we, of course, had to carry out the ashes if Dad wasn't there. And there were many times when Dad wasn't there because in the wintertime, Dad being a farmer, you don't farm in the wintertime in Chicago, he took a job at Taylor Chain Company in Chicago Heights to make ends meet, put food on our table. In the summertime, it was in the field from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. for all the able children and dad. Of course, mom stayed at home with the other kids. We had an hour dinner break from 12 to 1, and that was our big meal of the day. And mom was a one fine cook, let me tell you. One of my best memories of working in that field in the summertime was pulling the huge weeds, the ones that had deep roots, stood this tall. Remember, those were the days, Pat Woods, before we had a lot of chemicals to spray the weeds and kill them. They just grew up with the crops, kind of like the wheat and the tares, you know. Every weed had to be pulled by hand, and there were plenty of weeds to go around. I can't tell you how many hours we spent on our hands and knees crawling through that onion set field pulling the weeds out one by one we all back to the big weeds when the weed was so big that one person couldn't handle it we'd holler party weed and that has a whole different meaning than what party weed is today trust me the four of us older kids would get together we'd all grab a hold of that weed and we'd pull it out the work was hard, and there was little or no reward, or at least it seemed so at the time. There were no summertime vacations, but we always did look forward to Memorial Day, because on Memorial Day, we would take flowers to Grandpa Sickman's grave. After that, we got to go to a restaurant. It was our one time a year we were allowed to go out to eat. And guess what? We got a store-bought burger. French fries, and a malted milkshake. And trust me, that was a big treat. And then one time a year, we had a Sunday school picnic. And we also had a 4th of July picnic. And we always made those every year. And that was big because we each got a dollar to spend. And that dollar had to pay for your food, and every little other trinket you might want to buy or whatever. Those were hard times, and we were monetarily poor. 
when school started, we each got one new pair of shoes for school, and we got our yearly school clothes. And then there weren't many of them, and they had to last all year. I can't tell you, and I can't imagine how, just how many hours I saw my mom sitting on the couch darning holes in socks. Uh, people don't even know what darning holes in socks means anymore today, I don't guess. But back in the day, that's the way it went. And, of course, patching up the holes in the knees because we always crawled holes into the knees of our pants. We carried our lunches to school in a brown paper sack. Our sandwich was wrapped in wax paper. When we got done eating our lunch, we had to fold up that wax paper, put it in the sack, fold up the sack, put it in our pocket, bring it back home to use it again. See, you're familiar with that, aren't you? <laughs> we used to make a game of seeing who could make that lunch sack last the longest. I can't help but remember telling uh, Terry Sawyer that story one day. Me and him were uh, together at our Tuesday prayer and share, actually, and me and him were the only ones there. He said, let's go to the gas station up here at the Exxon and have a cup of coffee and just talk. I said, okay. He said, tell me, tell me about you. Tell me about your life. I told him that story about the paper sacks and drinking my coffee. I look up, and there's tears running down his eyes. I said, Terry, man, don't cry for me. Those were actually the richest times of my life. When I was 15, I got permission from my dad to take a job away from the farm, which I did at a local school, school bus shop. I checked oil and water and tires on the school buses after school, and then on Friday nights, washed buses until midnight, and then washed buses all day Saturday. The only requirement was when we got a job outside the house, you pay room and board. Thought it was kind of mean at the time, but there again, another one of life's lessons I wouldn't take nothing for. I worked for that bus line until after I was married. In 1969, I married my high school sweetheart. I was five days and 19 years, I was five days, 19 years old. The following year, our first child was born, my mini-me, my son Bill my one and only son. Two years later, our first daughter was born, Angela. And three years after that, our second daughter was born, Tina. Life was just so good until after 15 years, it ended in divorce. And I'm going to go on record here saying 100% this man's fault. She was the best wife and mother a man could have ever had. There was another marriage, lasted five years, and ended in divorce. That one was doomed from the beginning, born in sin. Then in 1990, I met and married Norma. And most of you know Norma. And I'm happy to say that in nine days, we'll be married 30 years. Now, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. As many of you have probably noticed, I'm sure Brother Stephen did, God has only been mentioned one time yet in this little talk. And that was when I talked about mom and dad. Because I can't talk about my mom and dad without mentioning God, because God was the center of their lives. Here are some things that I didn't mention in that first part. When my dad was in the army, he was known as the Christian. When his comrades took a shower, they were scared someone was going to grab their wallet and steal their money. So what they do, give it to the Christian. He won't steal nothing. I was honored to receive from my mom after my dad passed away, not only the Bible he read from every day, but the New Testament he carried in his pocket all through the war that he had received from his Sunday school class at church. 
I've already passed that treasure on to my son, Bill, my and my dad's namesake. My mom and dad's first and main goal in their life was to know Christ and to make him known. Acts 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, for mom and dad, Jerusalem was home. It was their eight kids. Yep, they were dirt poor farmers, but their very first goal was to make sure their children were immersed in the saving blood of Jesus. Therefore, they started from infancy in the home, teaching us about Jesus. One of my very first memories, and I was trying to remember this last Wednesday night, is my mom rocking me in the rocking chair and listening to a Bible story on the radio. And I, I just couldn't get the words straight, but I got them straight, Carol. You were there, weren't you? Yeah. There was a radio show. Remember, no TV. Aunt Teresa, would you tell me a story? Aunt Teresa would say, what kind of a story? Of course, the children would say, any kind. And then they'd say, boys and girls, Aunt Teresa will tell you the right kind. And that, of course, was a Bible story. When the church doors were open, Bill and Grace Sickman were there with whatever kids were able to go, the ones that were old enough. Despite their economic despair, they put eight children through 12 years of Christian school. That's a lot of tuition, folks. Mom added it up one time because all of us didn't go to kindergarten, only five of us did, the ones below me. There was over 100 years of Christian education and tuition. Here's some more good news. Five years after Norma and I married, a little miracle entered into our lives. And that little miracle is named Madison. I know that I've told Madison literally thousands of times how much I love her. And that was a love that my sister Kathy calls a ferocious love. Ooh, Bill gets sentimental. I'm not here to tell you. I don't know that I've ever told Madison, but one of the reasons for that ferocious love is this. After I divorced my first wife and left my three beautiful children, I went through a period of long despair. Despair over what I'd done. How could I leave the love of my life and my three beautiful kids? That is unforgivable. I knew God had forgiven me because I asked him to. But I just couldn't forgive myself. It took that beautiful verse... Romans 8, 28, and Pastor Scott Wright, most of you, some of you, no, I won't say most of you, many of you remember Pastor Scott Wright to remind me of this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Wow, it finally hit. No, God didn't orchestrate my sin but he made a way for Madison to have a daddy, someone who had raised her to love and fear God. Praise God. He turned my worst sin into something beautiful. Not the sin, but <laughs> the result. 
Even though at a fairly young age, I think I was 15 years old, 14 or 15, because of all the pouring into of my parents, spiritual pouring into of my parents, my Sunday school teachers, my school teachers, because remember, I went to Christian school. We, we got it all the time. All our youth leaders, everybody. I came to the full awareness that Jesus died for me, and I wanted to claim him as my Lord and Savior. So I made public profession of faith in front of the church. That was about 1965. For the next 35 years, I went like this. A lot of, lot of spiritual ups and downs. To be honest, I think I have to admit it was mostly, as Brother Stephen called, I think this is how he says it, I was doing just a mechanical response to a religious experience. You know, doing what I thought was right, going to church every time the doors were open, becoming a Sunday school teacher, but not always for the right reasons. When I lost my dad in 2000, it was not only a major blow to me, but it was a big eye-opener. I began some real soul-searching. Didn't like at all what I saw. I wanted more. I needed more. I was, had a craving for a real, genuine relationship with Jesus. And as Scooter used to say, I wanted to worship him wide open. And I wasn't getting it here at this church. I, I didn't feel I was getting it. And I began to pray about it. And my prayers were answered. Long came praising more. Now, some of you don't realize how much praise more changed my life. I was felt so held down because we didn't holler, amen, hallelujah. We didn't clap our hands. Audrey, you know how to do it. I actually thought about joining a black church because those people know how to praise our king of kings. That's just the truth. They know how. They'll get you going. Well, the Holy Spirit started working in me. I was no longer going to church because it was the right thing to do. And I was coming for the right reasons. I wanted to join my fellow Christians in praising and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Well, the years are flying by like weeks. You know how that goes, too, I'm sure. The older you get, the faster they go. Then in 2004, I lost my mother. This time, it wasn't a major blow. It was a major celebration. Celebration of her new life with Jesus. Yeah, I was sad. I cried. But there was a major difference here in me. Then came 2005, a year that God changed my life immensely. In June, I went on my walk to Emmaus. That was like Paul's road to Damascus. God said, whoop, stop, fella. You are not your own. You, everything you have belongs to me. And by his grace alone, I was able to say, okay, Lord, I surrender. Do with me and my stuff whatever you want to do. In October of that year, God opened a door for me to go on my first mission trip to Rio Bravo. Another huge blessing. 
There I learned in one week's time the real meaning of what it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that you can't outgive God. Perhaps most of all, how much more rewarding it is to give of yourself instead of writing a check. Between June of 2005 and June of 2008, God opened doors. I walked through. God closed doors. And I stopped and I waited. He systematically built up my trucking business. I was running something like 16, 17 trucks at the time. And it turned from, are we going to make payroll this week to a profitable business? And just as systematically, he shut it down. I was just following his lead. It's okay, Lord, whatever you say. Shut it down little by little. And not only without losing money, but I actually made money just listening to God. From 2008 to 2016, when I retired, he provided me with more than enough work to pay the bills and to be a blessing to others. He's also enabled me to go on that Rio Bravo mission trip for 15 years in a row. This is my testimony, but still not the end of the story. Did you know that Jesus has something to say about testimonies? Let me dig it up here a minute. In John chapter 5, verses 31 to 40, Jesus says, now these are words written in red. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Do what? There's another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony is true about me. You talking to the scribes and Pharisees, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. Talking about John the Baptist. And he's telling me, if you'd only believed what he said, you, you had the opportunity to be saved. I have a testimony weightier than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. Now there's a slap in the face, isn't it? For you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Jesus is telling them you're basing your whole salvation on scripture. And remember, scripture was the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament do? points to the coming of the Savior. And he said, here I am. In the beginning was the Word. Remember that one? The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became what? Flesh. Dwelt among us. Here I stand in front of you, and you don't believe. The very Scripture you're basing your salvation on is condemning you. That's what he's telling the scribes and the Pharisees. I'll let my verses get away here again. No, I didn't. I finished them. <laughs> Good job, Bill. So, I'm really not here 
this morning so you can know more about me. Believe it or not, I'm really not. I'm here to tell you about the one that gives my testimony credibility and validity, that validity that Jesus is talking about. I'm here to tell you about the one that gives the testimony about my mom and dad, validity. I know many of you have heard me say this before, and I left it out to the end because it's like the icing on the cake. Remember that story about the fork? We can save the best till last. After my mom passed away, we had to settle the estate, clean out the house. And then my mom and my mom and dad's bedroom, girls went in there with a vacuum cleaner, going to vacuum the floor. Four holes in the carpet, not holes, but dents in the carpet. Wouldn't come out. Two on this side of the bed, two on the other side of the bed. You know where those dents in the carpet came from? They were there because every night before they went to bed, they were on their knees praying. Every morning when they got out of the bed, their knees hit the floor. You see, their testimony was never based on what they knew. It was based on who they knew. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything in their life pointed to Jesus. Not to them or how much they knew about the Bible. This is exactly what Jesus is pointing out to the scribes and Pharisees. Not only to them, to us. He's telling us, don't get too comfortable where you're sitting there. Remember that sermon called The Comfortable Pew? If it ain't a sermon, it should have been. Don't get too comfortable. You say you know the Scriptures. Knowing the Scriptures, knowing a lot about You know, when we go to Rio Bravo, we have to say, say verses before we eat. Every table has to have a verse. And it's kind of a standing joke. Sit at the table with Bill because he always knows the verses. Some kind of a verse. He's going to know it. But guess what? Those verses ain't going to save Bill Sickman's soul. That knowledge doesn't save your soul. You can know the cover of, I mean, you can know the Bible you, from cover to cover. You can read it from cover to cover every year. You can know hundreds, maybe thousands of verses. But if you leave out Jesus, you haven't got a thing. Nothing. And that's why I'm here today. Not so you can know more about me, but so you can know more about my Jesus, how he changed my life. I want you to know more about the Jesus that changed the lives of my mom and dad. Same Jesus, my, eight, my seven siblings. I want you to have a personal relationship with my Lord and Savior. How can we do that? Glad you asked that question. There is only one way. The way, the truth, and the life. Start putting some dents in your carpet. Get on your knees. Confess your sin. Repent. He will hear. He will forgive. And he will change your life. There's 2 Chronicles 7.14. Again, that's my life's verse. Love the verse with everything in me. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear them. I'll hear them from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll heal their land, but I'll heal their lives. 
Folks, God will change your life if you surrender to him. Get a good prayer life started. Pray about everything. Pray for your parents for if they're still alive. Pray for your children. Yes, please pray for your children. Our children need it so bad. They need it so bad. Well, that's the end of my testimony. I hope in some way it has blessed your heart. And I hope that you will start putting dents in the carpet. Thank you. said that Jesus was the only person that you really need to know. This is called Give Me Jesus.
And now, dear friends, because you know this, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him, to him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Go with God.